we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is the first class in a series of 12 on the books of uh, First and Second Peter and Jude that uh, Matt Bogosian and I will be team teaching. We'll be going back and forth uh, week to week. Uh, <clears throat> today's class, OK, so over the course of the entire course, uh, First Peter has five chapters. We plan on spending uh, six weeks, uh, the first six classes on the five chapters of First Peter. Second Peter has three chapters. We're going to um, take four weeks, uh, seven weeks, seven through 10 on that. And Jude has one chapter. And the plan is to do, do that in two classes. Hopefully, we actually get out of First Peter. Right? We'll see what happens. Today, uh, this is the outline for what we're going to do today. What is First Peter known for? Um, what are the key themes? Who wrote First Peter? Which might seem to be an easy uh, question to answer. Who is the audience? And uh, we're going to do chapter 1, uh, actually uh, 1 through 9, probably not 1 through 12. So let's, let's begin our time with prayer. <clears throat> Father, it's always a uh, it's always a wonderful thing to open your word together um, as we approach this book, which uh, though it was written to uh, men and women two thousand years ago, is still so uh, applicable to us today uh, in the in the themes that it discusses, uh, in the counsel that it provides. I pray, Lord, that you would be advising us, you would be counseling us, you would be shaping us by your word and by the, uh, the instruction that Peter gives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when you think of First Peter, what, if anything, comes to mind? I don't know if you have ever thought about this. You're in heaven. You see... Um, Micah, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you wrote that. And he asks you, well, what was my book about? And you say, I have no clue, <laughs> right? It's so embarrassing. We really should know what each of the books of the Bible is about. Um, with that statement, <laughs> uh, what comes to mind for you, if anything, with First Peter? Written by Peter. Christy. Topic of persecution. Yes, persecution, suffering, trial. You know, Kelsey, you can't piggyback on somebody else's answer. <laughs> you were like, yeah, yeah, I, me too. <laughs> Here are some things that might be some phrases that we've heard, uh, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. Some verses that we're familiar with. Uh, in chapter 2, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, later on in chapter 2, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. In chapter 3, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So you might be saying, oh, that's where that is. I'm familiar with that, that verse. I didn't know that was in First Peter. And... Uh, Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And one last one from chapter 5. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, 
the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So those are all passages that we're familiar with. But um, what I'd like us to do is actually spend a little time reading 1 Peter. I was going to have us read the entire book this morning, which would take about 20 minutes. So um, I ran that by some people, and they nixed that idea. So we're going to do about half that. We'll do the first three chapters. I need a, I need a reader for 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay, Rebecca, I need a reader for 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'll take 1 Peter 3. So what I want you to do <clears throat> while we're reading through these three chapters is it, you should have something to write on. Okay, because if there's a key theme that you see sticking out, I want you to write it down on a piece of paper because I'm going to ask you what the key themes are of the three chapters that we just read. Okay, so as we're reading, you can write that down. Also, keep your eyes peeled for any references to anything about who wrote the book, about his background anything that would tell us anything about the writer, and also the people to whom he's writing. Okay, so theme, author, audience. Anything that strikes you, uh, maybe with a pencil, put a little um, check mark in the margin or something like that of, of the scripture as you read it. But um, let's go ahead. Rebecca, 1 Peter chapter 1. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, 
since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have, been, you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being filled up by, as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, is that stands in Scripture. Behold, I am lay, laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stumbling stone and a rock of, rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a, royal, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow, sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin, and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Okay, chapter three. <clears throat> Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives with, in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, 
so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. <clears throat> okay, so the first three chapters of First Peter. Are there any themes that stood out to you while we were reading through that? Okay, so holiness, I know how to spell it, holiness, uh, righteous living, what else, yeah. Jesus' work. Mm -hmm. Elliot? Good. Suffering and its purpose. Okay, um, <clears throat> compared to the world around you. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, life in the world, but not of the world. Submission, okay. Take one more. Faith. Faith. Good. Faith, and to use another single syllable big word, hope. Hope is a, a really Im important theme in, um, in First Peter. 
Sorry, my computer times out when I don't use it. <clears throat> the, some of these themes are uh, contained in the short passage that we're going to be looking at today. Um, elect exiles of the dispersion speaks to their identity. We're going to talk uh, a, a bit more about that uh, a little later. Yeah. That's it for the whiteboard. So we're going to put it in exile. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Exile, uh, elect exiles of the dispersion, suffering. Um, now for a little while you have been grieved by various trials. This is in chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, future hope that we're called to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And uh, Christian living which really, uh, just like uh, Paul's epistles, there's a first part and a second part. Um, there's a, a first part through chapter 2, I think it's around verse 10, and then everything after that relates a lot more um, specifically to Christian living, um, what Nick called, you know, living in the world and how we're different, okay? Uh, what, it, what it means to submit to governing authorities, um, servants with their masters, husband, uh, wives with their husbands, husbands with their wives, life with each other, those sorts of, of themes. <clears throat> in the world, okay, with each other, and Christian living in the face of suffering, which is a huge theme in the book. So who wrote First Peter? <clears throat> it says... Chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 1, um, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, we're all um, strong evangelical conservative believers. The Bible says it. Peter's the author. That's good enough for me. We don't need to discuss it anymore. There are some objections, though, that people have made to Peter being the author that we should be familiar with. And see how we respond to them. Uh, okay, one of them is the style. All the commentators agree that the, the Greek of First Peter is perhaps the finest in the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> really good word choices, but not just that, the, the rhetoric, um, the way uh, sentences are balanced shows uh, somebody who was well-educated. Paul was very well-educated, right? We, we're not surprised when we see that sort of writing in Paul as much as we can see it in the English translation. But Peter was, uh, according to what they say in Acts, what the high priest says about him in Acts, he was an uneducated common man. He was an unlearned fisherman from Galilee. So how would you answer that objection? First Peter couldn't have been written by Peter because it shows someone who is very well educated and he wasn't well educated. Um, well, it's written by God through Peter and it says that Peter wrote it. And then Peter wrote it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So God is the ultimate Author, yes, Andrew. Do you know like, how far along in ministry this was written? Okay, good question. Um, most most people believe it was written around sixty four between sixty four and sixty eight A.D. So, so it, it could be that through those years he, he improved. Yeah, I, uh, Peter had a mission, right, to uh, people throughout the world, not just within Judea, right. Um, if he's intent on sharing the good news 
in a, a world that is dominated by the Greek uh, language, maybe he spent some time learning it. Yeah, he's from Galilee, okay? Galilee is surrounded by a lot of secular towns, okay? They all spoke Greek. Um, he's almost certain to have known Greek himself as far as writing it. Um, he would have had, probably had to improve in the 30 years. 30 years is a long time between um, Jesus' death and when the epistle was written, yes? Okay, well, you just keep that to yourself, okay? We'll talk, <laughs> you keep that to yourself. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, one more. Um, I, I never really understood these objections. Like, when, if I were to come across this, I mean, I hold that the Bible is true, and that's not. Mm -hmm. You know, if the unbeliever is ever going to be converted, he has to start from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, if these, just for me personally, like these questions, I don't pay attention. Well, I guess you can tune out for a little bit because we're going to continue looking at some of the objections okay. uh, in case you want to be able to make an, an, an answer. But here, here's a very good answer. He had 30 years to improve his Greek. Subject. Um, the subject of Peter's epistle indicates uh, imperial persecution that came after Peter's death. <clears throat> the emperors who promoted persecution were Nero, okay, but not until the end of Nero's reign. It, when Nero started off, he started off okay. But uh, the, the destruction of Rome by fire happened in 64 AD, and that's when he really started to uh, tighten the screws on the uh, Christians because he blamed the Christians for the fire. Okay, I'm not going to ask you for your responses to it because it's already 10:15, and I want to make sure we get to to everything that that we um, we need to. Um, how to answer this particular objection? You've read through First Peter so far, the first three chapters. The persecution that is described in in those chapters. It doesn't necessarily have to be imperial persecution. It could have been the typical persecution that we see written about in Acts, right? Um, Paul in uh, <clears throat> Lystra, uh, he's stoned there. Uh, later on in Ephesus, the way the mob um, rose up against him, that sort of persecution is more than sufficient to account for the kind of suffering that Peter is writing about. <clears throat> uh, Wayne Grudem says, the statements about suffering in 1 Peter can be understood as general statements addressed to Christians where there was a likelihood of localized persecution. Next uh, objection. The phrasing in 1 Peter sounds a lot like Paul. I have some examples um, of it. And, we don't have, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. So love one another earnestly from a pure heart, Peter says. Love that issues from a pure heart, 1 Timothy. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is what he says in 1 Peter. Paul uses the same words in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. Uh, Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance in chapter 1. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How would you answer some of these similarities? Yeah. Two ways. One would be what Crystal said. They both have the same author behind the author. 
That's right. Right. And then secondly, we know that Peter read Paul's writings because he said they were hard to understand. That's right. So in um, 2 Peter 3.15, Peter talks about Paul's writings. So he had read Paul. And he probably uh, read him pretty closely. Do you think he read him somewhat devotionally and really reflected and meditated upon him, what he wrote? Do you think that the way Paul wrote and the things Paul wrote about may have affected Peter and the things that he wrote? You can see how, um, how likely that is to happen. Also, if, um, if 1 Peter wasn't written by Peter, because it sounds a lot like Paul, why wouldn't the person who claimed to be Peter just have claimed to be Paul? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Doesn't include scenes from Jesus' life. Uh, well, Peter already included a whole lot of scenes from Jesus' life in what gospel? Mark. Mark. Okay, John Mark was a close associate of Peter and the tradition is that he wrote his gospel based upon Peter's recollections. And we've been going through, at least I have in uh, the sermon series on 1 John, that, that uh, epistle. There are no scenes from Jesus' life in 1 John. John wrote a gospel that has all sorts of scenes from Jesus' life. There is one objection that maybe I, I'd be interested to see what you would say to this one. Chris, First Peter is written in polished Greek, like we already noted, but Second Peter is written in poor Greek. If he became educated over the course of 30 years and could write in, in a more elegant fashion in, in his first letter, why would he go back in his second letter to writing poor Greek? Rebecca, you had your hand up? Well, I was thinking, was it maybe uh, intended for a different audience? Okay, that's, I suppose that's possible. Uh-huh, yeah. Matt? Um, well, I was going to steal. Okay, we'll come to that in a second. Elia? Yeah, 2 Peter refers to the letter that he wrote previously. So uh, 2 Peter comes after 1 Peter. But everybody turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 5, verse 12. Can somebody read that for me? Joel, you got it. Why don't you read it? Okay. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you. This Sylvanus is Silas, just a different way of writing his name. Okay. Uh, he was, we believe, a well educated Greek. And a number of commentators believe that it's quite likely that. Peter used Sylvanus in the writing of the letter. It doesn't take away from his authorship. You'll see sometimes in a store um, a book that's written by so-and-so and then it has below his name with so-and-so. So he's the, the main writer, all the ideas, the concepts, the, the train of the argument is by the author, but the actual writing down of words is left to somebody else and maybe in collaboration. There's no question, if this were the case, that the Holy Spirit has inspired Peter and to the extent that Sylvanus contributes to the epistle, Sylvanus in, in bringing forth the words that we're reading today.
Yeah, Jen. Well, even today, authors who write a book and it doesn't say with so and so, they could have multiple college degrees, but they've all got editors yes. who are working behind the scenes to help them clean up and clarify, correct with misspellings, whatever. That's right. Even today, we have smart people who get a lot of help from other people. That's true. Before it becomes a number one bestseller. Yeah. <clears throat> what do we know about the audience from chapters one through three? Who was Peter writing to? Anybody make notes of that while we were reading through the first three chapters? Yes. Well, I was just thinking that it was ordinary folks. He talks about servants, wives, husbands, um, just regular people. Excellent. Yeah. So servants, wives, um, the early church was full of um, not the people that stand out, right? Not the, the, the people who are wealthy and powerful, um, but the first group that, and it's a long paragraph that he address, addresses is, is servants. Um, he addresses wives and he does it in the context of uh, the wives being good um, character witnesses, if you will be, uh, to, to their husbands, okay? Uh, and that's so often the case in a lot of cultures today where the churches are, are, are at least initially dominated by women, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We actually read a. We didn't read a passage, but in chapter four, it says that they're upset that you're not participating in all the Gentile behavior around you. Okay. What else do we know about the audience from chapters one through three? Yeah. I think they're probably Jewish. Okay. Good. Good. Let's um, hold off on the Jew Gentile thing, but for for a minute, and let's take a look at chapter one, verse one. Elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Oh wow. Okay. So there's a map. Um, of uh, what we call Turkey, um, or Asia Minor back then, Anatolia. This whole peninsula is called Anatolia. And you see, uh, I've highlighted in yellow, I don't know if, how well you can make it out. Uh, Pontus is to the northeast, the top right. Uh, that's the first town, or I'm sorry, province, region that's listed. <coughs> then kept then Galatia, he lists, right? Which is right in the middle of the screen. Um, actually, these, these names represent large areas, and Galatia is a very large area that goes uh, to the east. So to get from Pontus to Cappadocia, you would go actually through Galatia, down to Cappadocia, then across to the west. That whole, you see that, that arc there? That's uh, three different, I'm sorry, four different regions. Troas, Mysia, Phrygia, Lydia, and Caria, all there along the coast, except for Phrygia goes over closer to Galatia. So Asia's very large um, area. And then up to Bithynia, which is on the uh, northern coast there. <clears throat> A lot of people commentators believe that what this is doing is tracing uh, potentially a, a delivery route of the letter, like what we see in the book of Revelation. 
the seven churches in Revelation, uh, are all on a, on a mail route uh, in East, uh, Western Asia there. You can't see the, but a number of the names like Pergamum and uh, Laodicea are there on that map. And they're all within that area. The, the letter in Revelation was supposedly carried around uh, to those um, churches. This, um, this one is similarly carried around through these different regions. The question of Jew Gentile, um, how, how did these people hear the gospel in the first place? We know that Paul went to Galatia, he went to Lydia, he went to a number of places in Asia, but we also know that he was forbidden, it says in Acts, he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go to Bithynia. Pontus is all the way up in the north there. How would they have first heard the gospel? Turn to Acts chapter 2. At Pentecost, you have Jews from throughout the Roman Empire have come back to Jerusalem for the, the feast of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down. This is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 8. The Holy Spirit has come down, and everybody's speaking in tongues, and they say, how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So we see in this list three of the areas that are mentioned in 1 Peter, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, specifically listed. Now, certainly this list is just representative. It's not exhaustive of all the people that are present. <clears throat> the, the thought is that Jews who um, experienced this at Pentecost and were born again went back to the, the places that they lived, the places they came from, and that's how the early church started. We do know that um, Philo was, um, was a Jew writing in um, about 30 B.C., and he says that there's an extensive settlement of Jews throughout the area of Pontus. Um, Aquila, Prissa and Aquila, and, uh, that, who Paul relates to, Aquila was from Pontus. So that's probably how, at least in the north, some of these people first heard the gospel. And now the question of, are they Jews or Gentiles? Uh, where did I have that? Hold on a second. Yes, okay, so Christy, you, you uh, mentioned that one passage. Although they may have heard from the Jews originally, first Peter bears indications that the audience was not exclusively Jewish, but probably comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. How could he write to a Jewish group once you were not a people, once you had not received mercy? Would God say that to Jews who had grown up with his word? In chapter 4, verse 4, it says that the Gentiles are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. Well, no Gentile would be surprised that Jews weren't joining them in their debauchery because Jews lived separate lives. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, I was just going to say also in chapter 1, I think it's verse uh, 18, 
knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, um, even though you know we know that most Jews were it ended up being futile. If we actually look at this, this is would be referring to Gentile ways because Peter would not have Jew would not have looked at you know the legacy that they had gotten as futile. Right. Like the Ten Commandments and the law and all that stuff. Good. Good. <clears throat> yes, so Paige. It's to the elect exiles of the persuasion. So where were they? They weren't from those places, right? They went to those places on the map. Okay. Good. So let's move on to the first two verses of chapter one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. And Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. What does Peter mean by elect exiles of the dispersion? So literally, that phrase, elect exiles, means chosen sojourners. Not so much exile as uh, people that are forced to dwell away from their homeland. Uh, not so much as stranger, um, uh, as if they were unknown by the people that they lived among, but a sojourner. Uh, a temporary residence away, a resident away from one's homeland. In what sense are they exiles? In what sense are we exiles? Um, no, they're not displaced people in the sense that they've been sent away from where they've lived, but they're displaced in a different way. elect exiles or chosen sojourners. That word elect, okay, or chosen, it's used 22 times in the New Testament and it always refers to persons chosen by God for inclusion among God's people as recipients of great privilege and blessing. You see a difference between elect and chosen? Does that, does that difference register with you? It, it certainly did with me. Um, elect seems like a somewhat cold term, but chosen has a relationship involved. These are people that God has chosen, sense of love, devotion, so we see in Deuteronomy chapter 7, chapter uh, 7, verses 6 through 8, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chosen for you are the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you. Uh, David Helm wrote, do you see the comfort associated with this word elect? The term elect is meant to encourage the church. It is to remind the people of God of his great love Peter intended to assure his early dispersed readers of God's steadfast love. <clears throat> and it does more than combine two different things. We have elect exiles, right? A very positive term and one with a lot of negative connotations, okay? We're chosen but we're, to some extent, outcast. We're sojourners. We're not where we belong. At the same time, we're chosen. 
these are two very different things. It's also talking about two different timelines. For how long are we chosen? It's an eternal thing. For how long are we sojourners? For a brief little while, Peter says. Time is really important in these opening verses of 1 Peter. He's placing the, the, the suffering, struggling believers in, in uh, Asia Minor between two really important um, bookends. Matt, uh, yesterday at men's meeting, um, talked about the the Christian life as a, a bunch of books. And if, if the books are on the bookshelf, if there aren't bookends to keep them upright and intact, they're going to fall, they're going to be in disarray, they're going to lean over. And the bookends that Matt, um, he was pulling on uh, Jerry Bridges <clears throat> that we talked about yesterday, the bookends were the righteousness of Christ and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter, we have two different bookends that Peter is presenting. We have the, and, it, and it's temporal, in time. It's historical, looking back to what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, his death and resurrection. And the other bookend is our future hope keeping our lives in order, the way we're supposed to live our lives, is bookended by these tr two enormous truths about who Jesus is, what he's done, and the future inheritance that we're going to enjoy. And we live our lives between those bookends that give order and meaning uh, to the way we're supposed to live. It's the basis of the entire argument that he makes in the second half of his letter. These are fundamental truths about identity, about who we are. OK. Uh, the last word there is a, a dispersion. Uh, and we're familiar with the word diaspora, maybe. The Jews in the diaspora, sorry, um, scattered throughout the world. Same thing. Peter is adapting a term that's applied to God's Old Testament chosen people to God's New Testament chosen people. I think we'll have to finish with verse 2. That's how far you have to go next week, Matt, starting in verse 3. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. What are these words applied to? What is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father? What is in the sanctification of the Spirit? Jerry. All those words in verse 2 go back to that phrase that's highlighted, elect exiles of the dispersion. These elect exiles of the dispersion, it's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, all these Prepositional phrases go back to elect exiles. We don't have a lot of time to go into what foreknowledge is, but take a look down at verse 20. It's more than just a factual knowledge in advance. It has to do with God's personal, loving, fatherly knowledge. So at verse 20, <clears throat> he, being Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. That, for, that Jesus was foreknown. That's more than just God had some factual knowledge about who Jesus was, right? 
It's a relationship. That's the foreknowledge that we see in um, chapter 1, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So you can see how Peter is writing this to encourage, to provide a very foundational encouragement to, the, um, to his audience. They're, they're facing struggles. They're facing difficulties. They are exiles, but they are elect exiles, all according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And it's for the purpose of their sanctification by the Spirit that they would obey and be sprinkled by the blood of Christ. You can write down Exodus 24, 7 to 8. That, that's a, um, a good passage to look at in connection with uh, the sprinkling. <clears throat> anybody have any, it's 1043, anybody have any um, final comments, thoughts, maybe by way of application? Yeah, Robin. Aliens. What does that mean then for us? Are we aliens? Yes. Are we comfortable in this world? How, how much time do we spend trying to be comfortable in this world? How much time should we spend trying to have a comfortable existence? Jerry. It's, it's really a wonderful picture here of the, the triune God securing who we are and uh, sovereignly controlling all of our circumstances, everything. We have God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ. I have a couple other passages that are somewhat similar. Um, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, Jude 20 and 21, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, awaiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. There are a number of these triune Trinity statements in the New Testament, and this is one of them. And we'll close with this. David Helm writes, in the strongest way poss possible, Peter has told us, the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is behind all this. The hidden counsel of the eternal trinity has planned for us to be known as elect exiles. Let's pray. Lord God, I look forward to coming weeks when we have the opportunity to spend more time in your word, um, reading what you've, you've written through, through Peter and seeing how it applies to us. We're grateful, Lord, for the truths that you have reinforced to us this morning about the, the nature of our, our lives in this world, that we are exiles, but all the while that we are exiles, Lord, we are chosen, for, chosen by you. And while our exile may be for a little while, Lord. Our um, election, our relationship with you is eternal. And we, just like um, Peter, we look forward, our Father, to how you will, in the future, bring this to a great consummation in the day of Jesus Christ, when he returns and... Uh, brings to completion the great inheritance which you've given to each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.